He was a gray, nondescript looking fellow you wouldn't notice on the street unless you looked closer and saw his mad, bony skull with its strange youthfulness and fire. A Kansas minister with exotic, phenomenal fires and mysteries. He had studied medicine in Vienna, known Freud too, had studied anthropology, read everything, and now he was settling to his life's work, which was the study of the things themselves in the streets of life in the night. He sat in his chair. Joan brought drinks, martinis. The shades by his chair were always drawn day and night. It was his corner of the house. On his lap were the Mayan codices and an air gun, which he occasionally raised to pop benzedrine tubes across the room. I kept rushing around, putting up new ones. We all took shots. Meanwhile, we talked. Bill was curious to know the reason for this trip. He peered at us. He snuffed down his nose. Now, Neil, I want you to sit quiet a minute. Tell me what you're doing crossing the country like this. Neil could only blush and say, Ah, well, you know how it is. Jack, what are you going to the coast for? Only a few days. Um, I'm going back to school. What's the score with this Al Hinkle, and what kind of character is he? At the moment, Al was making up to Helen in the bedroom. Didn't take him long. We didn't know what to tell Bill about Al Hinkle. Seeing that we didn't know anything about ourselves, he whipped out three sticks of tea and said to go ahead, supper'd be ready soon. Ain't nothing better in the world to give you an appetite. I once ate a horrible lunch cart, Hamburg on tea, and it seemed like the most delicious thing in the world. I just got back from Houston last week, wanted to see Kells about our cotton. I was sleeping in a motel one morning when all of a sudden I was blasted out of bed. This damn guy had just shot his wife in the room next to mine. Everybody stood around confused, and the guy just got in his car and drove off, left the shotgun on the floor for the sheriff. They finally caught him in Huma, drunk as a lord. Man ain't safe going around this country anymore with a gun. He pulled back his coat, he showed us his revolver, then he opened the drawer and showed the rest of us his arsenal. In New York, he once had a machine gun under his bed. I got something better than that now. German shine tooth gas gun. Look at this beauty. Only got one shell. I could knock out a hundred men with this gun and have plenty of time to make a getaway. Only thing wrong, I only got one shell. I hope I'm not around when you try it, said Joan from the kitchen. How do you know it's a gas shell? Bill snuffed. He never paid any attention to her sallies, but he heard him. His relation with his wife was one of the strangest. They talked till late at night. Bill liked to hold the floor. He went right on in his dreary, monotonous voice. She tried to break in and never could. At dawn, he got tired, and then Joan talked, and he listened, snuffing down his nose. She loved that man madly, but in a mental, delirious way of some kind. There was never any mooching and mincing around, just talk, and after all, a very deep companionship that none of us would ever be able to fathom. Something curiously unsympathetic and cold between them was really a form of humor by which they communicated their own subtle vibrations. Love is all. Joan was never more than ten feet away from Bill and never missed a word he said, and he spoke in a very low voice, too. Neil and I were yelling about a big night in New Orleans and wanted Bill to show us around. He threw a damper on this. New Orleans is a very dull town. It's against the law to go to the colored section. The bars are insufferably dull. There must be some ideal bars in town, I said. The ideal bar doesn't exist in America. An ideal bar is something that's gone beyond our ken. In 1910, a bar was a place when men went to meet during or after work, and all there was was a long counter, brass rails, spittoon, play a piano for music, a few mirrors, barrels of whiskey at 10 cents a shot, together with barrels of beer at 5 cents a mug. Now all you got is chromium. Drunken women. Bags, hostile bartenders, anxious owners who hover around the door worried about their leather seats in the law, just a lot of screaming at the wrong time and deadly silence when a stranger walks in. We argued about bars. All right, he said, I'll take you to New Orleans tonight and show you what I mean. And he deliberately took us to the dullest bars. We left Joan with the children. Supper was over. She was reading the one ads of the New Orleans Times Picayune. I asked her if she was looking for a job. She only said it was the most interesting part of the paper. You could see her point. A strange woman. Bill rode into town with us and went right on talking. Take it easy, Neil. We'll get there. I hope. <laughs> There's the ferry. You don't have to drive us clear into the river. He held on. 
Neil had gotten worse since Texas, he confided in me. He seems to be headed for his ideal fate, which is compulsive psychosis dashed with a jigger of psychopathic irresponsibility and violence. He looked at Neil out of the corner of his eye. If you go to California with this madman, you will never make it. Why don't you stay in New Orleans with me? We'll play the horses over a great night and relax in my yard. I got a nice set of knives and I'm building a target. Some pretty juicy dolls downtown too, if that's in your line these days. He snuffed. We were on the ferry and Neil had leaped out to lean over the rail. I followed, but Bill sat on in the car snuffing. There was a mystic wraith of fog over the brown waters that night together with dark driftwoods and across the way New Orleans glowed orange bright with a few dark ships at her hem. Ghostly fog bound Sereno ships with Spanish balconies and ornamental poofs till you got up close and saw they were just old freighters from Sweden and Panama. The fairy fires glowed in the night and the same Negroes plied the shovel and sang old big Slim Hubbard had once worked on the Algies Ferry as a deckhand. This made me think of Mississippi Jean too. And as the river poured down from mid-America by starlight, I knew. I knew like mad that everything I had ever known and would ever know was one. Strange to say, too, that night we crossed the ferry with Bill Burroughs, a girl committed suicide off the deck, either just before or just after us. We saw it in the paper the next day. The girl was from Ohio. She might as well have come floating down to New Orleans on a log and saved her soul. We hit all the dull bars and the Latin Quarter with Bill and went back home at midnight. And that night, Luann took everything in the books. She took tea, goofballs, Benny, liquor, and even asked Bill for a shot of M, which of course he didn't give her. She was so saturated with elements of all kinds that she came to a standstill and stood goofy on the porch with me. It was a wonderful porch Bill had. It ran clear around the house. By moonlight with the willows, it looked like an old southern mansion that had seen better days. In the house, Joan sat reading the want ads in the kitchen. Bill was in the bathroom taking a fix, clutching his old black necktie in his teeth for a tourniquet and jabbing with the needle into his scrawny arm the thousand holes. Al Hinkle was sprawled out with Helen in the massive mester bed that Bill and Joan never used. Neil was rolling tea, and Luann and I imitated Southern aristocracy. Why, Miss Lou, you look lovely and most fetching tonight. Why, thank you, Crawford. I sure do appreciate the nice things you say. Doors kept opening around the crooked porch, and members of our sad drama in the American night kept popping out to find where everybody was. Finally, I took a walk alone in the levee. I wanted to sit on the muddy bank and dig the Mississippi River. Instead of that, I had to look at it with my nose against a wire fence. When you start separating the people from their rivers, what have you got? Bureaucracy, says Bill. He sits with Kafka on his lap. The lamp burns above him. He snuffs. His old house creaks, and the Montana log rolls by in the big black river of the night. Taint nothing but a bureaucracy. And unions, especially unions. A dark laughter would come again. It was there in the morning when I got up bright and early and found Bill and Neil in the backyard. <laughs>